Hey everyone, and welcome back to Share Trek Curiosity. I'm Tim. And I'm Jane, as always. It's great to be here. Glad to have you. And you know how much I love a good mystery. And today's topic is a big one. Oh, yeah. The origin of life on Earth. It's a big one. It is. Just imagine our planet billions of years ago. Right. Swirling volatile world. Yeah. Where did that very first spark of life come from? It's a question that has scientists and philosophers captivated for centuries, really. Yeah, and while we don't have a definitive answer yet, really? there are some mind-blowing theories out there. There really are. Okay, so let's talk about one of the prevailing theories. Okay. A biogenesis. Right. The idea that life arose from non-living matter here on Earth. Exactly. A biogenesis basically suggests that in early Earth's environment, um, simple organic molecules somehow assembled themselves into more complex structures, and eventually that led to the first life forms. So kind of like a primordial soup. Yeah. Where all these ingredients are simmering together until, bam, life emerges. Exactly. But there's another theory that throws a real cosmic twist into the mix. Okay. Panspermia. Panspermia. This one pr proposes that life, or at least its essential building blocks, actually originated somewhere else in the universe and were delivered to Earth. Wait, so you're telling me that life might have hitched a ride to Earth on, say, an asteroid, like some kind of cosmic delivery service? That's the basic idea. I love it. And while it might sound like something out of science fiction, there's actually some pretty compelling evidence to support it. Okay, this is where it gets interesting. Yep. So we've got these two main contenders. Right. Life arising from non-living matter here on Earth versus life or its building blocks coming from space. Right. To understand how either of these scenarios could even be possible, mm -hmm. we need to talk about one crucial ingredient. Yeah. Water. Water. We all know water is essential for life. Right. We need to, plants needed to grow. It's Pretty fundamental. Absolutely fundamental. But think about it this way. Water is more than just something we drink. It's an incredibly powerful solvent, meaning it allows complex molecules to form and interact in a way that wouldn't be possible otherwise. And early Earth had the perfect conditions for liquid water to exist. So you're saying those early Earth conditions with liquid water readily available could have been the ideal setting for life to emerge, whether the building blocks were already here or arrived from space. Exactly. And when we talk about the building blocks of life, we can't forget about nucleotides. Now, those are the components of DNA, right? The genetic blueprint that makes us who we are. You got it. Nucleotides are the building blocks of DNA and RNA, which carry the genetic instructions for all living organisms. Yeah. But figuring out how those complex molecules first formed is a major challenge. Yeah. Some scientists think volcanic activity or radiation might have provided the energy needed for simpler molecules to link up and create nucleotides. But if we're thinking about panspermia, the possibility of those nucleotides coming from space, where do asteroids and meteorites fit into all of this? Well, some meteorites, like the famous Murchison meteorite that landed in Australia back in 1969, have been found to contain, well, guess what? Okay, you're going to make me guess. Was it evidence of alien life? Not quite, but close. The Murchison meteorite was found to contain amino acids, sugars, and even nucleobases. Wow. All essential components for life as we know it. It's like opening up a time capsule from the early solar system and finding the ingredients for life tucked inside. That's pretty mind-blowing. It is. So these building blocks, these essential ingredients, could have been delivered to Earth on these space rocks, like yeah. a cosmic care package. That's what panspermia suggests. And it's a pretty compelling idea when you consider what was happening in the early solar system. Around 4 billion years ago, Earth experienced a period called the Late Heavy Bombardment, where it was pummeled by asteroids and comets. Oh, wow. Yeah. So you're saying that this bombardment, instead of being a destructive force, might have actually been what seeded Earth with the ingredients for life. That's one of the fascinating implications of panspermia. And this idea is getting even more support from recent space missions. We're actually retrieving samples from asteroids now. You're talking about missions like NASA's OSIRIS-REx. Yeah. And Japan's Hayabusa 2, right? Those missions that actually went out, grabbed 
pieces of asteroids and brought them back to Earth for us to study. Exactly. And what's incredible is that those samples have revealed the presence of more organic molecules, including amino acids. Wow. That's it's like having a direct line to the early solar system, confirming that these building blocks can exist and travel through space. It's amazing to think that we're living in a time where we can collect samples from asteroids and analyze them in labs here on Earth. Yeah. It's like science fiction becoming reality. So we have evidence from meteorites that crash landed here and samples we're actively retrieving from space. Yeah. It's pretty wild. But I have to ask, if these building blocks are tough enough to survive space travel, couldn't they have just formed here on Earth? That's the big question, isn't it? And this is where the debate between abiogenesis and panspermia really heats up. Abiogenesis suggests that life emerged from non-living matter right here on Earth, while panspermia proposes that life or its essential building blocks originated elsewhere and were brought here. So maybe it's not an either situation. Maybe both processes were involved. Yeah. Could some organic molecules have formed here while others were delivered from space? It's certainly possible. The origins of life are incredibly complex and it's likely that a combination of factors played a role. We're still piecing together the puzzle. And speaking of piecing together the puzzle, there's another intriguing aspect to this whole cosmic connection. Okay. Water. I mean, we talk about how essential it is. Right. But could Earth's water have also come from space? Now that's where things get even more interesting. It definitely makes you look at a glass of water a little differently. But I have to admit, I'm a little confused. If these organic molecules, these building blocks of life, are so delicate, yeah. how could they possibly survive the harsh journey through space? I mean, we're talking extreme temperatures, radiation, the vacuum of space. It doesn't exactly sound like a friendly environment for delicate molecules. You're absolutely right. Space is an incredibly hostile environment. But here's the fascinating part. These organic molecules can actually be surprisingly resilient. Okay. They can be trapped within the icy layers of comets or embedded within the rocky matrix of asteroids shielded from the worst of space's hazards. So it's like they have their own little protective bunkers. Yeah. Keeping them safe until they reach their destination. Exactly. And when these celestial travelers collide with a planet like Earth, the impact releases these molecules scattering them across the surface. It's like a cosmic seed sowing operation spreading the potential for life far and wide. Okay. That makes sense. Yeah. But... If these molecules are so resilient, couldn't they have just formed right here on Earth? Why even consider the possibility of them coming from space? That's the crux of the debate between abiogenesis and panspermia, isn't it? Abiogenesis proposes that life arose from non-living matter right here on Earth, while panspermia suggests that those building blocks, or perhaps even early life itself, originated elsewhere and were brought here. So it's not necessarily a case of one theory being right and the other being wrong. It could be a bit of both. Precisely. It's possible that both processes played a role. Perhaps some organic molecules formed on Earth while others arrived from space, or maybe life arose on another planet and was then transported to Earth via panspermia. The possibilities are truly fascinating. It's like a giant cosmic puzzle. And scientists are trying to piece together the clues from all these different fields, astronomy, geology, chemistry, biology. It's a truly interdisciplinary endeavor requiring collaboration and insights from a wide range of scientific disciplines. And thankfully, with advancements in technology, we're now able to gather more evidence than ever before. Speaking of evidence, you mentioned earlier those incredible missions to asteroids like NASA's OSIRIS-REx and Japan's Hayabusa 2. Those missions brought back actual samples from asteroids, right? Yes. Those missions were groundbreaking, providing us with an unprecedented glimpse into the composition of these celestial bodies. And remember, those samples confirmed the presence of organic molecules, including amino acids. And so we have actual physical evidence supporting the idea that these building blocks of life can exist on asteroids. This isn't just theory anymore. We're actually seeing them with our own eyes, right? Absolutely. And those samples are providing us with more than just confirmation of organic molecules. They're also giving us clues about the origin of Earth's water. Right. We keep coming back to the question of water. You mentioned something about studying the isotopic composition of water earlier. What exactly does that mean and how does it relate to asteroids and comets? Imagine you're a detective trying to solve a crime. Okay. You find fingerprints at the scene and compare them to a database to identify the culprit. Right. Well, scientists do something similar with water. Different sources of water have slightly different ratios of isotopes, 
which act like fingerprints. By studying these isotopic ratios, we can trace the origin of water. So it's like a cosmic game of fingerprint matching. Yeah. We're comparing the isotopic fingerprints of Earth's water to the water found in comets and asteroids. That's a great analogy. And what's fascinating is that the isotopic composition of some comets and asteroids shows a striking resemblance to Earth's water. This suggests that a significant portion of Earth's water could have been delivered by these icy bodies early in our solar system's history. It's incredible to think that something as fundamental as the water we drink, the water that makes life on Earth possible, might have come from those very same space rocks that delivered the building blocks of life. It's like a cosmic gift package. It truly highlights the interconnectedness of everything in the universe. We're not just inhabitants of Earth, we're citizens of the cosmos, yeah. connected to the vast web of matter and energy that makes up our universe. This is all so fascinating, and I'm sure our listeners are just as captivated as I am. Yeah. But before we get too carried away with these mind-blowing concepts, let's take a moment to regroup. Okay. We'll be back in a flash to discuss the implications of all this for the search for life beyond Earth. Stay with us. Welcome back to Share Trek Curiosity, everyone. We've been on quite a journey today, haven't we? We have. From the primordial soup of early Earth to the vastness of interstellar space, exploring the mysteries of life's origins. It's been incredible, that's for sure. We've discussed some pretty mind-blowing theories, but I want to make sure we're all on the same page. We've talked a lot about possibilities, but what are the actual evidence? What concrete proof do we have to support these ideas of abiogenesis and panspermia? That's a great question, and that's where the real detective work comes in. Scientists are constantly searching for clues, and some of the most compelling pieces of evidence come from those meteorites we were discussing earlier. Ah, uh, yes. Our old friend, the Murchison meteorite. Exactly. The analysis of meteorites like Murchison has revealed a treasure trove of organic molecules. We're talking amino acids, sugars, and even nuclear bases the building blocks of DNA and RNA. So these aren't just hypothetical molecules we're talking about. This is physical evidence, tangible proof that these compounds can exist in space and survive the journey to Earth. Precisely. And it's not just Murchison. Numerous other meteorites have been found to contain organic molecules, further strengthening the case for a cosmic origin of life's building blocks. These space rocks are like time capsules, giving us a glimpse into the conditions of the early solar system. And what about the evidence for Earth's water coming from space? We talked about isotopic composition earlier, but can you remind us what that means and how it connects to this idea? Sure. Think of it this way. Every element, like hydrogen and oxygen, the building blocks of water can have slightly different forms called isotopes. Okay. These isotopes act like fingerprints, unique identifiers for different sources of water. Scientists have analyzed the isotopic composition of water in comets and asteroids, and guess what they found? Don't keep me in suspense. Ooh. Did they match Earth's water? Some of them did. The match isn't perfect for every comet or asteroid, but the similarities are strong enough to suggest that a significant portion of Earth's water could have been delivered by these icy bodies early in our planet's history. It's amazing to think that the water we drink, the water that sustains all life on Earth, might have originated in the depths of space. It really shifts your perspective. It does. To think that our planet, our very existence, is so deeply intertwined with the cosmos. I agree. It's a profound realization. And it begs the question, if life's building blocks and even water could have come from elsewhere, what are the implications for life beyond Earth? That's the big question, isn't it? Does this mean we're not alone in the universe? Are there other planets out there that might have also received a cosmic delivery of life's ingredients? It's certainly a possibility. If the ingredients for life are widespread throughout the universe delivered by asteroids and comets, then the potential for life on other planets is vastly increased. Imagine countless worlds scattered across the cosmos, each with the potential to harbor life. It's a truly awe-inspiring thought. It really is. And it makes the work of astrobiologists all the more exciting. Mm. They're not just searching for life beyond Earth. They're trying to understand the fundamental processes that led to life's emergence in the first place. It's a search for our cosmic origins. And it's a journey of discovery that's just beginning. With every new mission, every new analysis, we're getting closer to unraveling the mysteries of life's origins and the possibility of life beyond our pale blue dot. Well said. 
Well, folks, we've covered a lot of ground today. We have. We've explored the mind-boggling theories of abiogenesis and panspermia. Right. Delved into that fascinating world of organic molecules. Yeah. And pondered the cosmic connection of Earth's water. Absolutely. We're just a small channel trying to grow, and we'd love to hear your thoughts on today's episode. We would. So please leave a comment below and let us know what you think. And if you enjoyed the show, don't forget to like, subscribe, and share it with your friends. Every little bit helps us reach more people who are curious about the universe and our place in it. Until next time, keep looking up and keep those questions coming. Remember, the universe is full of wonders. Just waiting to be discovered.